Hello again, welcome to part three of our Mario and Luigi series review. This is the final part before I compile all these videos together into one big series retrospective, which is how this was supposed to be, but ugh, I hate myself. <laughs> so in this video, we're going to be covering the last of the Mario and Luigi games, and they're both on the 3DS. We have Mario and Luigi Dream Team and Mario and Luigi Paper Jam. So let's take it back over to Pass Me and wrap things up. Bye. Hey, hi. You might have noticed that the shot looks slightly different. Well, that's because when I took a break from filming to move all of my stuff to the computer, I bumped into the tripod ever so slightly. Ah, I, it is late. I should not be filming at this time, but we're gonna keep going anyway because I love you. You might have also noticed that as we get farther along, uh, the summaries for each game are starting to get a little bit shorter. But that's not because I want to get this video done and over with as soon as possible. I mean, I kind of do. But from Superstar Saga onwards, the only major changes that come with each game are with the music, the story, elements of the gameplay and the combat, and just the overall gimmick. So at this point, it's kind of like Smash Brothers in that it's a matter of what each installment of the series has to bring to the table. I don't know why, but I feel like I have all this energy, maybe because I had a lot of cupcakes and hot chocolate earlier before filming. <laughs> I don't know what to do with myself. So, the Mario & Luigi series first made the leap to the Nintendo 3DS in 2013, and since that was during the Year of Luigi, or as Luigi himself liked to call it, The Year of Me. This gave Alpha Dream a chance to widen his role and basically make him the center of attention. Thus, we got Mario and Luigi Dream Team. The 3DS officially became the permanent home for the Mario and Luigi series, and because of that, I couldn't record my own footage of these games in the most comfortable or professional manner. So for the sake of keeping the quality of the footage consistent, the clips of this game that you'll be seeing were recorded by Zack Scott Games, unless this little, uh, Credits graphic down here states otherwise. I'm still going to be sharing my own personal thoughts and experiences with these games, but I'm just not going to be passing the footage off as my own. Because... That baby ain't mine. <laughs> the story begins with Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Toadsworth, and a group of Toads leaving the Mushroom Kingdom as they've been invited to this place called Pilo Island. On the way there, Dr. Snoozemore, proprietor of the island, tells them that he's conducting research on a magical power that puts people to sleep. It's called a podcast, and he communicates with them through this TV screen that Bragi apparently has on his backside. I also find it ironic that Snoozemore would be studying this topic, since I'm pretty sure he has severe narcolepsy. When they make it to the island, they find Starlo hanging around Pilo Castle. Oh, great, my least favorite character from the last game is back. Break out the champagne. And smash your face in with it. But then Peach and Toadsworth accidentally send themselves away on a moving platform, and Mario and Luigi follow soon after. But before they can find them, the bros have to go through a series of challenges given to them by Smoldergeist, which involves killing a bunch of monsters in order to progress. You know, if he really doesn't want us to go farther, he shouldn't have to keep opening doors for us. Is that just an obligation he has to follow as part of the challenges? By the way, does anyone else think the Pilo symbol kind of looks like the Discord logo? Well, eventually they do reunite with Peach and Toadsworth, and it's here where they stumble across a magic pillow. With badges inside. Bit of a weird way to introduce them, but okay. Afterwards, they come across a collection room with various treasures on display, and Luigi takes a nap on a giant bed. Using the pillow while he's sleeping causes a portal to the dream world to appear over his head, and then a dark figure grabs Princess Peach and pulls her inside. Mario quickly jumps into the portal to try and find her, but soon comes across a dream version of Luigi. Together, they break open a nightmare chunk and release Prince Dreambert from within who's also revealed to have been the magic pillow the brothers found earlier. It's later revealed that Pilo Island was home to the Dream Stone and the Dark Stone, two magical rocks that could, uh... Well, this is a Mario RPG, so 
I'm gonna say they make toast? Oh, so close. The Pilos tasked themselves to protect the stones until Antasma, the Bat King, stole the Dark Stone, planning to use it for his own purposes. Unable to defeat him, the Pilos sealed him away in the Dream World, but Antasma retaliated by shattering the Dark Stone into pieces that rained down over the island and encased the Pilos in nightmare chunks when touching them. Dreambert tells us that he won't be able to free them without Mario's help, but they also have Antasma to worry about since he was able to use Peach's power to escape into the real world. And he also teams up with Bowser because... Well, they had to bring him in somehow. The plot is a little more straightforward this time, with some odd spots here and there, but still pretty entertaining. And since Dream Team was released in celebration of Luigi's 30th anniversary, he's given a much bigger role, which makes me very happy. Why does Starlo have to be so hard on him, though? Sure, he's a bit more timid and clumsy than Mario, but he's perfectly capable of holding his own. Maybe that's why I'm not super fond of her. Either that or because she keeps showing up in these games when she really doesn't need to. Or the onslaught of tutorials. I already know how this stuff works by now, Starlo, so could you please for one second shut ya damn mouth? I do find it funny when the second Pilo we rescue points out that Starlo is basically naked. Hey now! Who's nude? Open your eyes! I have shoes! Yeah, that settles it then. It's like saying, hey, I'm not a cannibal. I only eat fingers! Luigi's also given much more significance in the gameplay. Like in Bowser's Inside Story, the Mario Brothers will be traveling between two different worlds. The real world still has you running around wide open spaces, while the dream world is where the 2D action takes place. To get to the dream world, Luigi falls asleep on these other magical pillows to create portals that Mario will have to jump into. If you're wondering why it doesn't work when Mario tries to sleep on the pillow, well, because Luigi can fall asleep almost instantly, so the speed at which he conks out is enough to make the portal appear. Well, I've played Luigi's Mansion 3, so this doesn't come as a big shock. In the dream world, Mario is accompanied by the dream version of Luigi, or dreamy Luigi as the game and possibly Daisy call him. The two of them can break open nightmare chunks to rescue the Pilos trapped inside, allowing the Pilos to return to the real world where they can assist the brothers in various ways. Reaching further parts of the dream world often requires you to do a lot of puzzle solving, and that's where Starlo comes into play. Yeah, you can technically play as her now. By using the touchscreen, you can have Starlo mess with Luigi's face to make certain things happen in the dream world, like pulling his mustache to get tree branches to launch Mario from a particular distance, or making him sneeze to push background elements into the foreground or blow some scenery away. The dream world also has you finding Luigi Noid. <sighs> Stupid freaking chair! The dream world also has you finding Luigi Noid formations, constellations in the shape of Luigi's face. Luigi Noids are basically duplicates of dreamy Luigi that he can summon by entering the formations. Luigi Noids can then stack up on top of each other and be morphed into different shapes, allowing Mario to do things like a spring jump or swing them around to destroy objects blocking your path. I felt that the Dream World sections were much more involved than the inside of Bowser's body in the last game. You still had plenty of vital actions to perform in helping him unlock new abilities and execute boss fights, and you could have him do things to affect your progress at the same time, but you didn't have much else to do until Bowser got himself into trouble and you either had to play a minigame to help him out or just leave for the time being and carry on with your side of the story. The interaction between the dream world and the real world is more intuitive, the areas are more aesthetically pleasing, and the times where you have to go into the dream world don't disrupt the flow of the game. I don't like how the map on the bottom screen keeps switching back to Luigi sleeping every time you move. I wish there was an option for you to manually toggle between displays. Why is it that the Mario and Luigi games before the remakes keep struggling with having decent map functions. Exploration and progression aren't the only two things that are different in the dream world, but so was the combat. In the real world, it's the same as it ever was, only now enemies drop coins when they're defeated during the battle. Kind of like Paper Mario Sticker Star, but with experience points. So it's actually fulfilling. And Mario and Luigi also each have their own unique set of bros attacks, with most of Mario's targeting single foes, 
and most of Luigi's targeting multiple foes. In the Dream World, Mario fights by himself with help from the Luigi Noids, which increases HP and deal more damage to his opponents. And instead of Bro's attacks, Mario can use luigi Nary attacks, where the Luigi Noids can help Mario do more damage if he stacks enough of them. The 3DS gyro controls come into play here, and they're a little awkward, but you don't need to use them for every attack, so that's okay. Remember the giant Bowser fights in the previous game? Well, now, before taking on certain bosses, Dreamy Luigi will combine with dozens of Luigi Noids to become Giant Luigi. These fights use the touchscreen in a similar manner to Bowser's Inside Story, but Luigi has a couple more actions to perform. These involve beating opponents upside the head with his hammer, tapping mushrooms at the same pace that Mario throws them to replenish his health, and using the gyro controls of the 3DS to have Mario land a successful hit while riding a star, all the way from SPASH. Dream Team also introduces expert challenges, which basically act as achievements you can get for performing certain actions in battle. Completing expert challenges gives you points, and earning enough of them will reward you with stronger equipment. It's a pretty neat feature, but I'm not really concerned about consecutively landing excellent hits when I'm fighting off bad guys. I just want to kill them and get it over with. I'm also kind of worn out from battling because I've been playing these games back to back for the past three months. I haven't showered, slept, or seen my family in forever! This was the worst idea I ever had. I apologize that this summary is a lot more generalized than the other games, but as much as I'd like to go into more detail, that's pretty much what you get with Dream Team. The Dream World setting is a lot trippier than what we're used to, which is very welcoming, but while the story has a lot of the same charm as the first three games, it also kinda lacks in terms of twists and surprises. There are a few, like near the end when Bowser uses Antasma as a pillow, and then Mario and Luigi go into his Dream World, but Antasma sorta comes off as a generic bad guy and doesn't have as strong a presence as Cacoletta or Princess Shrew. I love the idea of exploring people's dreams, and it makes for a great mechanic. I just think if they took the plot in a more exciting and unexpected direction, pushed Bowser into more of a secondary role, and made Antasma a more intimidating villain, the game could have been a lot stronger for it. The presentation, on the other hand, is top-notch. Dream Team moves away from the pixel art style of the first three games, and now the backgrounds are completely 3D, while the characters are 2D sprites shaded to look three-dimensional. Achieving the stereoscopic 3D effect apparently also added three years to the game's development, but it really makes the game pop, and I think it was worth it in the end. The soundtrack didn't immediately strike a chord with me, and Admittedly, I think Yoko's Kingdom Hearts side tends to show more than her Mario and Luigi side. But the updated instruments breathe some much-needed life into the music, and like in Bowser's Inside Story, the music changes when you enter the dream world, which, again, is a very nice touch. All in all, I don't think Dream Team is better than Bowser's Inside Story, but it's still a pretty fun game in its own right, and one that I'd like to try again someday. So that just leaves us with the latest game in the series that isn't a remake, Mario and Luigi Paper Jam, released in late 2015. And... Oh boy, this is gonna get personal. You guys know how much I love Paper Mario, so you can imagine when this game was announced, I was surprised, but also quite intrigued. A crossover between Paper Mario and the Mario and Luigi games? I mean, I still wasn't a huge fan of the latter at this point, but <laughs> let's go, bro! But Sticker Star was the newest Paper Mario game during that time, and seeing that Paper Mario's representation in Paper Jam was based entirely on that game turned my fascination into skepticism. So if I end up being a bit harsher towards this game than the other ones, I apologize in advance. But Sticker Star is a bunch of garbage anyway, so don't let that put you off. Up until now, I've played almost every single one of Mario's role-playing adventures, and generally, I've enjoyed my time with them. But when Paper Mario comes into the picture, there's just no way I can judge it without being a little bit biased. Still, this is a Mario and Luigi game first and foremost, and I couldn't let my preferences affect my opinions on it too much. That being said, 
This game is such a letdown, it almost hurts to think about. Paper Jam opens with Luigi and Toad going up into the attic of Peach's castle, where a scaredy rat pops out through a crack in the wall and chases Toad around. <laughs> During the commotion, Luigi bumps into a bookshelf, causing a giant book to fall on him. Then the book opens up and releases characters from the Paper Mario universe, except any of the good ones, into the Mushroom Kingdom. I didn't like this at first, but since most of the Paper Mario games have a sort of storybook aesthetic already, I think having that world exist as a book in the Mario and Luigi universe fits pretty well and makes the most sense. But anyway... <laughs> yes, good point. Paper Toads scatter all across the kingdom, so both Peach and Paper Peach task Mario and Luigi with going out to find them. Oh, and Starlo's here again. I don't know why, but... There she is. Wait, now she's saying she represents the Star Spirits? I thought it was Star Sprites. Was that just a goof on the part of the localization team? Or is Star Spirits supposed to be a sneaky reference to the original Paper Mario? Well, that's to assume that anyone at Nintendo recognizes that any of the Paper Mario games before Sticker Star even exist. But they hardly ever do. Oh. There's still hope for you after all! Unfortunately for them, Paper Bowser's minions have also flooded the Mushroom Kingdom. And I love that the first thing Mario and Luigi do when confronting a paper enemy is fold it and crumple it up. <laughs> That's pretty funny. But after they get trampled by a wheel of Paper Goombas, Paper Mario swoops in and saves them. It's here where the duo becomes a trio, as Paper Mario decides to tag along for the ride. But while the three of them are off on their adventure, Bowser and Bowser Jr. team up with their paper counterparts, invade Peach's castle, and capture the princesses. From this point onward, the plot becomes the two Bowsers threaten to take over the kingdom, and the Mario Brothers and Paper Mario have to stop them. I should also mention that while I was taking notes for this video, Paper Jam was where I had the most to talk about with the story. But not because it gets any deeper, it really doesn't. Compared to previous games, Paper Jam is much simpler and safer. So most of my notes are just me complaining. It doesn't hurt the series as much as Sticker Star hurt Paper Mario, because the Mario and Luigi games already had relatively simple plots, but they still threw in a lot of fun twists and new characters to keep them from feeling like normal Mario games, just with different skins. Don't expect any of that here. Newer Paper Mario games already had a problem with there being too many Toads and Goombas and the like, but now Paper Jam gives you twice as many, making me dislike it twice as much. You don't run into any new characters at any point in the game, and the only character that returns from the other Mario & Luigi games is Starlo, who I wasn't very big on to begin with. Apparently original characters were considered, but the team felt it would be too challenging to fit them at an appropriate appearance in the story, and that they already had a lot of characters to work with. But come on! Paper Mario has a fantastic and hugely varied cast of unique and original characters that you could play with, and the other Mario & Luigi games do as well. So don't tell me you already have a lot of characters to work with when you resort to sticking with the same generic enemies and supporting characters we've seen before, and your idea of a new character is a Lakitu that introduces himself as... a Lakitu. This game just reeks of untapped potential, especially for me coming into this as a fan of both Paper Mario and now the Mario & Luigi series. Seeing these two worlds collide is very appealing when you're just looking at a screenshot or maybe fan art, but the way it's executed here is not as satisfying as it should be. Spider-Man No Way Home this ain't. Maybe if the Paper Mario side sucked here, but the Mario & Luigi side was great, I could find something to appreciate there. The thing is, you're not getting the best of what makes either of them so great. Each side is only giving you the bare minimum. The Paper Mario aspect is explored so little that it ends up coming off as superfluous. And there might be a reason for that. Paper Jam might be selling itself as a Mario & Luigi Paper Mario crossover, but it wasn't initially planned to be that way. Just to touch on the gameplay for a second, the main gimmick revolves around Paper Mario acting as a third character to fight alongside Mario and Luigi. Alpha Dream already experimented a bit with having you control other characters, like in Partners in Time and Bowser's Inside Story, but they were either extensions of Mario and Luigi or separate characters going on their own adventure. 
This time they wanted a third character to join the brothers in combat and be mapped to their own button. They eventually settled on having it be a second Mario, which is how Paper Mario came in. They also considered adding Paper Luigi as a fourth character, but they thought it would make the game too complicated. But, I don't know, Partners in Time had you play with up to four characters and that worked out okay. I'm not sure how it could have been done here, but it still feels weird having Paper Mario, but not Paper Luigi. I mean, he does show up a couple times, so it's not like he was completely neglected, but it's it's just not the same, you know? Why did it have to be a second Mario anyway? Partners in Time already did that too. If they really needed someone to fill that third character slot, why couldn't they just think of a new fighting style and create a character around that? Well, wait, we can't have any new characters because we've already got a lot to work with. Okay, so... What about Princess Peach? We never got to play as her in the other games, so this could have been a great opportunity to put her more in the spotlight instead of just having her be a damsel in distress again. Maybe they could have explored that wish magic they gave her in Bowser's Inside Story. Yeah, after that game, it's kind of glossed over. And you know, it's not like they're incapable of figuring out how to do it. Super Mario RPG made her playable, and that was made by the same people. Hang on. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. There seemed to be quite a number of things that were intended to be part of the game at some point, but had to be scrapped or taken out, either because the dev team wasn't sure how to implement them, or they really just don't know what their fans want. So Paper Mario characters are brought into the Mario and Luigi world, right? Well, how come the Mario and Luigi characters never travel to the Paper Mario world? Well, because the developers thought it would be too complex, and that... No one would enjoy it. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really. First off, the option to travel between two different worlds is nothing new for the series. Partners in Time, Bowser's Inside Story, and Dream Team all had their own variations of this mechanic, and each one was incorporated in a way that was simple but still inventive. So. What exactly would have made traveling between the Mushroom Kingdom and the Paper World any different? Second, no one will enjoy it? Are you kidding me? People would have loved that! I can't speak for everyone, obviously, but there is so much that could have been done with that idea. Like, maybe Mario and Luigi could have been trapped in the book, and Paper Mario would be stuck in the Mushroom Kingdom trying to get them out. And maybe the chapters in the book could be based on events from the Paper Mario games that play out in a different way since most of the characters in the book would have been taken out. Does someone else take the Star Rod if Bowser isn't there to steal it? Would the Shadow Queen need another vessel if Peach isn't there for her to possess? You see how much better this could have been? Uh, maybe I'm just letting my imagination go too wild, but ultimately I feel the team focused too much on sacrificing fun ideas for the sake of keeping things simple, and Paper Jam suffers because of that. I do get the sense that they wanted to make this game bigger, but either they just got lazy or their pitches kept getting shot down by the higher-ups. Well, who supervised this project anyway? Oh. That explains everything. But that's just all I had to say about the story. What about the rest of the game? Well, it's fine. Yeah, it's just fine. It's not great, but it's not insultingly terrible either. It's about what you'd expect. However, some things have been tweaked a bit. You don't get to pick extra stat boosts when leveling up anymore, but Mario starts with his hammer by default, you're given bros attacks pretty early on, and instead of unlocking them by collecting attack pieces, you get them after catching the Nabbit at different times. Hey, it's me. Uh, they want to hear the line. So, uh, should I just hold the phone up to the camera or something? Okay. Dang, damn it! There you go. Thanks, man. Oh, and, uh, sorry about your wife. Expert challenges return from Dream Team, but you're not automatically rewarded with items and equipment when getting a certain number of points. Now you have to buy them from a shop, using the points you earn as a form of currency. 
Overworlds are the same as before, with Mario and Luigi being mapped to the A and B buttons, respectively. Meanwhile, Paper Mario is mapped to the Y button, and he can slip through tight spaces and explore certain areas on his own, like the Paper Thin ability in Thousand Year Door. In combat, Paper Mario can also make copies of himself to deal more damage, and every time he gets hit, he loses a copy and starts taking damage if he runs out of copies. In addition to the returning bros attacks, Mario, Luigi, and Paper Mario can perform trio attacks, which involves flattening foes with a giant cardboard hammer and then doing whatever the action requires you to do. The bros can still use items and gear, but the badges from the previous games have now been replaced with these things called battle cards. Did you like Paper Mario Color Splash? No? Well, good, because these don't work anything like the ones in that game. You can make a deck of 10 cards, and during battles you can use one card per turn, each one requiring a certain number of star points to use. They work like badges in that they can affect the battle in different ways, like dealing damage to your opponents, making enemies weaker, or giving you temporary stat boosts. You can also scan in certain amiibo figures to obtain special support cards, but... Eh, I mean, it's okay, but... I, I don't really care. Mario, Luigi, and Paper Mario all carry hammers, and on the overworld they're able to combine their hammer attacks to destroy large blocks or flip over pieces of cardboard. They can also do a simultaneous flutter jump with a press of the X button, and when they touch the ground, you can have them perform a dash by holding down the button and releasing. Then while running, you can press the A button to make them slide, which is only really needed during chase sequences, or the side quest that has you going after paper toads. Yeah, no thanks. But I guess I have to go look for them if I want to use more of those paper crafts. Giant battles from the last two games now have a spiritual successor in the form of paper craft battles. Paper toads you find on the overworld return to Peach's castle to help Toadette build these huge cardboard mech things that the bros can use to fight enemies piloting paper crafts of their own. Battles take place in these open 3D spaces, and you can dash into other paper crafts, or be thrown up into the air to attack from above. Dashing depletes your attack meter, so you'll have to charge it by standing on these platforms and pressing the Y button in time with the music, like a mini rhythm game of some kind. Each paper craft also has their own unique attributes. Luigi has a hammer, Peach can use her parasol to hover, Yoshi can ground pound and use its tongue to grab stuff from far away, and Fire Mario can shoot fireballs. These sections are... alright, I guess. They're definitely the best part of the game. And previous games have always used minigames to tackle other genres with mostly positive results. I just can't help but feel like the paper craft battles stand out a little too much from the rest of the game. The giant Bowser and giant Luigi fights still had you perform some of the same actions you would in traditional battles, so they felt more like a natural extension of the battle system. And while I do enjoy the papercraft battles to an extent, it's almost like a totally different game got crammed in here and they feel a bit out of place. Aside from that, Mario and Luigi Paper Jam is absolutely fine for what it is. I wouldn't go so far as to call it the sticker star of this series because I don't think that's entirely fair, but I guess it does feel like sticker star in that when comparing it to the games that came before, this one comes off as a huge step backwards, definitely in terms of pacing because this might be the most repetitive Mario and Luigi game yet. It's like every time you find yourself in a new location, you need to get somewhere, Something's blocking your path, you either learn a new ability or use the ones you already have to get past it, and then you get caught in a trap or sent to another area, then you'll have to find your way back, fight a boss, and move forward. However, Paper Jam does have some redeeming qualities. The 3D doesn't pop as much as it did in Dream Team, but graphically, it still looks really good. Despite the lack of unique characters and settings, the art style is nevertheless just as appealing as it was in the last game. Though, I think it would have been cool if the Paper Mario characters had their own unique font and speech bubbles to match how they look in the games they come from, but I, I'm a I've asked for too much already. As for the music, Yoko might not be giving us her best material, but there are still some pretty good songs here. I also find it cool that before Paper Mario joins your party, the battle music that plays when you're just controlling Mario and Luigi is a remix of the battle theme from Superstar Saga. Hmm, that's a nice little throwback. All in all, Paper Jam makes for a perfectly decent experience that I'm glad I didn't completely hate, 
but as a crossover between two of the most beloved series of spin-offs Mario's ever had, seeing such a promising concept done in such a boring and overly simple way will leave fans of both series wanting more, and ultimately feeling disappointed. I'll give it this though, it is the best 3DS game Paper Mario's ever been in. Then again, that's not really saying much, is it? Over the course of making this video, I've really grown to love the Mario and Luigi series, so it's kind of sad for me to see it go out not with a bang, but with a whimper. High development costs and dismal returns forced Alpha Dream to shut down in October 2019, and with their closure, the future of the series is completely up in the air. I'd like to think Nintendo will eventually hand the reins off to another developer, but maybe they just don't like the idea of two different Mario RPG series coexisting anymore? Or maybe the Bowser's Inside Story remake sold so poorly that it scared them into never making another Mario and Luigi game again. Well, you put it on the 3DS in late 2018. How did you think it was gonna go? It certainly can't be that people are tired of seeing Mario role-playing games in general. I mean, Paper Mario the Origami King did pretty well in terms of sales last year, so in Nintendo's eyes, that must be where the real money is. Fans might have some of the loudest voices in the gaming industry, and I'm sure there are some that would rather see Nintendo scrap Paper Mario and stick with Mario and Luigi, but developers often listen to the numbers more, and they kinda have to. Video game companies do have a large focus on trying to keep their fans happy, but if they want to keep their businesses up and running, they need to fish where the fish are biting. And why do you think we've been seeing less of Earthbound and F-Zero? Sometimes Nintendo will do something to appeal to fans of more niche properties like those, but let's face it, they're not as easy to bank on as Zelda or Pokemon. And the numbers don't lie. After Bowser's Inside Story, the Mario and Luigi games sold less and less as they came out. Paper Jam just barely passed a million copies, and the remakes kept slipping farther and farther below that amount. Was the 3DS really to blame, or was it problems with the series itself? Well, as far as Nintendo's concerned, it doesn't seem to matter. Because if Paper Mario games are still making big bucks, to them, that's all the RPG action Mario needs right now. Now, I'm not trying to rule out the possibility of Mario and Luigi making a resurgence in the future, because I really want this series to keep going. I'm just saying, based on the later game's track record, sad to say, but that might not be for a while. But you know what? I'm glad that I finally decided to buckle down and play through these games. Even if this experience did take off five years of my life. Oh. Now, how would I rank these games from best to worst? Well, I'd have to say Bowser's Inside Story is my absolute favorite for its high amount of charm and all the refinements it made to the formula. But then below that, I'll put Partners in Time, which I really enjoyed for its darker tone and fun gameplay elements. Then in third place for me is Dream Team for its unique blend of mechanics and the way it executes them. Then I'll have to put Superstar Saga in fourth because while I respect it for being the first in the series, it's a little too clunky for me to put it higher up on my list. And finally, at the bottom would be Paper Jam, which again, is not a bad game, but could have been so much better given the premise, and just feels like a big missed opportunity. I don't know if I'll ever make another video like this again, but knowing me, it's probably bound to happen at some point in the future because I hate myself. But one thing's for sure, when this is all over, and once I'm done filming and editing and uploading, when I'm done with this video, I'm going to be taking a long, long break. I've spent so much time pushing myself trying to get this video made. And you know what? It might not even get that many views, but I don't care. I, I really don't care. There's this fear, this anxiety that a lot of YouTubers deal with where they'll put so much time into their videos, like they'll spend hours, days, or even months making just a single video and the view count doesn't really reflect that and it can be heartbreaking. But you know, I, I don't really care about that kind of stuff because ultimately, and I've said this countless times before, what's most important to me is just getting stuff out there and hoping that people will find some sort of comfort or entertainment value in it. 
since the beginning. You've helped me get through a lot of my best times and especially a lot of my worst times. And because of you, I have been able to grow, not just as a content creator, but as a person. Words may never describe just how humbled and grateful and thankful I am to all of you for commenting and liking and subscribing and just sharing the videos around and just pouring all this support on me. I, I don't, I feel like I really don't deserve it. I really don't know where I would be without you guys. So I guess there's nothing left to say except uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Ramadan, whatever you celebrate. Happy holidays, love each other, don't be cynical, be good, behave, be safe, and here's hoping that a lot of you will stay with me going into 2022. So, uh, good night. I did it! It's finally over! Oh, I gotta sleep now.